alive and gold city known for its own culture. I imagine it a little bit like San Francisco, maybe, where it was a whole separate intellectual life, where there was a lot of music and theater and art. There's a whole school of poetry from Frankfurt. My father was a lawyer, and my mother was French, and um, <coughs> we lived in a very big, beautiful house. My father came from a, a smaller town, and he was uh, quite observant of the Jewish religion. And in World War I, he was in the German army, he was drafted like everybody else. And he did not want to shoot at other people, uh, regardless of who they were. So when they had purposely aimed way off the target, and they thought he couldn't see well, and they didn't think he was trustworthy with a gun, so they took the gun away from him. And he ended up in hospital administration. The other thing about my father was that somehow, even though he was in the German army, and even though there was a lot of prejudice against Jews, he managed never to work on the Sabbath, which is our day of rest. And how he managed that, I don't quite know, but it, oh, I always thought of it as a, a real achievement in the German army not to work on the Sabbath. When I got married and moved to Milwaukee, my mother gave me some crates of a crystal that had belonged to my grandparents. And the glasses and things were wrapped in newspapers. The crates had been packed in Frankfurt in 1930-31. Um, when my grandfather died and the household was packed up. I could hardly unpack them for sitting there reading those newspapers. And already then, they were full of stories about the brown shirts and the Nazis and uh, Hitler, and you could sense the rise of Hitler. When Hitler came into power, one of the first things he did was to institute a law saying that the right of the state superseded the right of the individual. Uh, that means that anything the state says goes and anything that an individual says doesn't really count. And every lawyer had to sign that, and my father refused. If you didn't sign, you weren't allowed to practice. Uh, so my father could no longer legally practice law. The next thing that happened was that arrests began. And just out of the clear blue sky, they came to your house and they arrested you and took you off to jail. The first time that happened, my mother was really upset and couldn't figure out what she should do. And in those days, we were allowed to take things to people in jail, you know, to food and clothes and things like that, personal possessions. So my mother packed up some things and went to the jail the next morning and took these things to my father. When she got there, she met most of her friends. Their husbands had all been arrested also. Now those were arrests without cause, just to annoy people, just to irritate them. But that's how it began very slowly. They were let out again a day or two later. But my father was blackballed by the Germans because of his refusal to sign away individual rights. Individual rights is what the whole, what we call the Napoleonic Code is based on. The Napoleonic Code is the basis of what we consider the legal foundation of our systems as well as in Europe. And the first thing Hitler did was to try and upset that. So as my father wouldn't sign that, the Nazis blacklisted him, and his life was not really very good under those circumstances. And we immigrated to Holland, to Amsterdam. We went to Amsterdam because Holland was not far away, and because my father thought it 
was a safe place to go and that he could live there comfortably. So we moved to a small town while my parents sort of got themselves back in one piece and then eventually they bought a house in Amsterdam and we moved there and I went to school there. My father went back to school also and studied at the University of Leiden, one of the oldest universities in the world, and um, again got his bar exam passed and became a Dutch lawyer. He was a man with, with great determination and great inner resources and intelligence. And he somehow always managed to put his life back together again and uh, earn a living for the family. When the Nazis rose up again, started expanding the German Empire. My father realized it was time for us to move on and began to institute ways of immigrating to the United States. Now, I think one of the things that really has been promulgated by television and the shows that we see there and various movies is that immigrants and refugees are with babushkas and little baskets and too many children and no money. World War II was not like that. The kind of immigra immigrants that I just described who ended up at Ellis Island and settled in New York were mostly from Eastern Europe and were very poor and had been persecuted in Russia and in Poland already. The kind of immigration that started in World War II brought people like Einstein to this country, and people who came from the middle class, who had professions, uh, who were accomplished, who had connections all over the world. Not that everybody was like that, but many of them were. So people have often said, uh, when I've talked about my background, how did your parents get money to come to the United States? Well, we had enough money, that was not a, not a problem. A problem was getting permissions, visas, getting a country to accept you. We did not leave Holland until relatively late. Many people were in denial that anything bad would happen in Holland. They felt it had happened in Germany, but not, was not going to spread further. And so, unfortunately, they stayed behind. My father tried to convince a number of my aunts and uncles and cousins to leave while they could. And some of them said, well, we don't think it's going to be that bad. We don't think this will happen. You're seeing it too pessimistically. Uh, we're going to stay. Unfortunately, they paid for that decision with their lives. I had a cousin, my favorite cousin, who, as a matter of fact, decided too late that he wanted to leave. He was about 18 or 19 at the time, and he uh, went to work on a farm in Holland where they trained young men to work on farms in Israel. And when the Germans invaded Holland, they just mowed those farms down. They just killed everybody off. Lost his life like that. I have another cousin who lived in Paris. And he was a boy at the time. He was probably about 12 at the time. An older sister and his parents. And they lived in the heart of Paris. And when the Germans expanded their empire and took over France, the Nazis came to arrest the family. And by chance, my cousin Annette, the older sister of Eric, happened to be spending the night at a friend's house. So she was not home when the Nazis came and took 
away her parents and her brother. They took all of those people to something called the Velo Dome in Paris. Sort of like a big arena where you might have baseball games or football games or uh, exhibitions. And again, strangely enough, people could go and visit there. So they were not locked up there totally. And my cousin Annette, who's the girl, thinks they could have just walked out of there had they chosen to do that. But people were afraid and people didn't. She went there to visit her parents and brother and to take them some stuff and uh, then never saw them again. Managed to get to free France. Part of France was occupied. The southern part of France was not. She escaped to there and managed to work for the underground. And she escaped. She had a very harrowing time going into occupied France again to do some of her work. She and a friend of hers uh, hid themselves in a truck that was carrying mattresses. And they sewed them into the mattresses. And at the border, the Germans stopped the truck and examined what was on the truck and didn't see anything. But they were a little suspicious of the mattresses. And they stuck their bayonets in the mattresses. They happened to miss my cousin and her friend. And uh, they made it to uh, Paris again to do their work for the underground. And she survived the whole war. When we go to Paris, I always see her. And uh, we don't often talk about these things. They're really in our past. Yeah. Was the underground like what was the underground? Is that just getting people out of It's like being a spy. Mm -hmm. Uh the French underground tried to do things that would sabotage and hurt the Germans uh without getting caught of course and save the French. There were ways of undermining the German war effort and uh they did small things that had bigger consequences. You know, they, they tried to put you know, sand in the gas tanks of the German cars. Uh, and whatever they could get away with that they could do. And then, of course, they had a whole spy network. It was very important for the Allies to know what the Germans were planning. And the underground kept its ear very close.
because the ships were being used in the war, the war had started. The war started in fall of 1939, and we didn't leave until September, de December, of December 1939. And it was very hard to get any kind of passage. Finally, they got everything where it should be. They had the passage and they had the visa to leave the country. And they went to an office in downtown Amsterdam. My father's office was very near where Mr. Frank's office was, uh, Anne Frank's father's office. Those are all circular canals in the heart of Amsterdam. And we went, my parents went to the office to sign the papers to be able to leave. And when my father took up the pen to sign the paper, he looked at his watch, and he saw it was 5.30 or whatever it was, and he said, the Sabbath has begun. And he didn't write, he was an Orthodox Jew, he did not write on the Sabbath. And he wouldn't sign. My mother, who was, who observed Orthodox laws, but didn't really believe in them, she did it for my father, uh, was fit to be tied. She was terribly angry because our lives were on the line and she felt if we didn't sign then we would lose our place and who knew what would happen. But my father did not sign. So it was Friday night. It was a drizzly, rainy Dutch winter evening and my father insisted on walking home because he didn't ride cars on the Sabbath either. My mother refused to walk and called the taxi for herself and uh, went home. And my father eventually got home. Sometime, some weeks later, through my mother's connection, because my mother had been born in France, she was considered French. Everything was always by the country where you were born. So my mother, having been born in Paris, was considered French. She was able to get a visa, and through that, managed to get passage for us on another ship. And we did then leave in December 1939. Meanwhile, the ship we were supposed to be on, which was an Italian ship, it was struck by a German for torpedo. And all aboard were lost, with the exception of two people. Those two people later came on our ship. We picked them up in England. Our lives were saved freely by my father's faith and his very firm belief in the Jewish laws. And uh, it's kind of an amazing story. Now, you at that time were about the age that these are right, right now. Um, was that for you, I'm, I'm sure your parents tried to protect you and not let you know everything that was going on, but were you scared? <laughs> was never scared, I, except once. When we were on board ship, we had to cross the English Channel. The English Channel was mine, and we had the Dutch maps of where the mines were, but of course the Germans had also planted mine fields, and we didn't have those. Uh, our ship was a passenger ship, and the war was on, and the ship was considered more or less expendable, and the other ships in our convoy of perhaps three more ships were considered more valuable because they carried more materials had to get through in order to be able to fight the war. So we were the lead ship in that convoy. And we had something called paravanes. Paravanes were like outriggers on the sides of the ship that cut the anchors of the water lines. And they floated just under the surface by the way that they were anchored cut the anchor chains and then the mines would bob up to the surface 
and then they would destroy them so that the ships wouldn't hit them. My brother and I got up very early one morning and uh, walked around the decks and we saw this strange thing floating on the water. It looked sort of like a bowling ball with uh, things sticking out of it. And we couldn't figure out what it was. And one of the ship's officers came past and my brother said, oh, excuse me, sir, but can you tell me what that is? And he thought, you know, annoying boy, I don't really want to give him the time of day. And he said, oh, it's nothing. And then he took a second look at the original, second look at something and really looked at it and ran. It was a mine that had been cut but was very near to our ship. And um, they then went after it in a small boat and shot it and it was a big explosion. We went across the English Channel, stopped briefly in a harbor in England, or a harbor area called the Downs, uh, just off the White Cliffs of Dover. And that area was filled with broken ships. It looked like the disaster had happened in somebody's backup toys. They were cracked with the front and the back into the water, cracked the other way. Uh, sticking out of the water sideways, and we stopped there to pick up some people, like the people on the torpedo ship, we picked them up to give them further passage. After we left there, we made our way to the island of Madeira, which is really off the coast of Africa, and on our way there, we were all in the dining room of the ship, things on board ship were always very formal and it was still, even though the war was on, meals were served very formally. And we were in the dining room at the table, all white tablecloths and little napkins and wine glasses and crystal and silver and so on. When the ship suddenly shook as if it had been going very fast, and then suddenly somebody stopped it. And our waiter was just coming with this large tray full of food for the 10 people at the round table we were at, and he dropped it and ran. And people all over the dining room ran out. Everybody was sure we hit the landmine. And the only person who stayed behind was my mother. And I never understood it as a child. I later asked her when I was an adult, Mother, why did you stay behind when everybody else was saving their life by going up on deck? My mother said, well, the captain was at the next table, and he didn't leave. And I thought, I will just do what he's doing. And she stayed calm stayed in the dining room. The rest of us ran, and I remember being up on deck. They were getting the lifeboats out and down and giving people life jackets. We had life jackets, but some people had brought them. And I debated whether I should jump overboard or wait for the lifeboats to be lowered because it seemed so dangerous and it seemed as if we would be blown up any minute. And as I was debating whether I should jump, they pronounced it all clear. The message came over the loudspeakers and they explained to us that we had not been hit, that a mine had exploded under the water some distance from us, that it was a mine or a torpedo that had been aimed at a submarine, a German U-boat. There was a major explosion. They probably hit it. And that's what shook our ship to such a degree. And so everybody went back to the dining room, back to the table. Our waiter came back and picked up all the debris from the floor and brought us another meal. And he then said, I'm not scared, I'm careful. 
And in my family, we still quote that. I'm not scared, I'm careful. Uh, to wait 
on the list of people who were born in Germany, of which there were a great many. We had gone from Holland to South America to Dutch Guyana, now known as Suriname. And uh, so we lived there, and it was very primitive living. And my mother and brother and I left because there wasn't decent schooling for us. My father stayed behind to wait for his visa and nobody to come up. Meanwhile, the war got worse, and the Dutch in Suriname put my father in jail for being an enemy alien. And uh, as a German national, even though he had resigned his citizenship, and we were legally stateless, he was in jail. And uh, as I said, he was very resourceful. He was allowed books and paper, and he wrote a, a law book while he was in jail. A law book while he was in jail. And then eventually his number came up, and he came to New York to meet us. And then he went back to school. He went to night school at NYU to pass his law in his bar exam again. Okay. And he uh, started his third career and did very well. I went through high school in three years because I got a lot of credit for languages. And by the time I went to college, I was fluent in English and had lost my accent. And I uh, went to college and tried to be like all the other girls uh, in my class uh, to blend in, not to be different. But I did not experience or uh, any of those things, anti, anything except anti-foreign. I think the anti-foreign came from this very sort of exclusive, isolated life that the people in my public high school in New York had lived. And they were not accepting of other things, had not been exposed to other things, were not interested. They were a pretty pitiful group. I don't think kids today are that naive and that isolationist and that uh, unaware of the world around them, at least in Oak Park. In Oak Park, certainly not. I spent the time between classes in the multicultural center. Uh, they would have looked at all that stuff and said, oh yeah, that's really queer, that's really odd. Uh, we live in a very different environment today, and I think particularly in Oak Park. It's wonderful. Uh, you had mentioned earlier this morning that oh. the immigrants that came because of the war, many of them were actually able to afford passage, and you, your family was able to afford passage. You weren't like destitute. No. But you certainly <coughs> must have had to leave some things. We left a lot of lost a great deal of money in the process of immigrating. Uh, I came from a very well-to-do family, and we lost a lot of that in the process of leaving and changing countries, and the fact that my father was a lawyer who couldn't work uh, many times because he didn't have his law degree in that country, or was busy getting it. So we did not, uh, have as much as 